This is the second part of today's session on vision and attention. After we've talked about the neural basis of visual processing um, in the retina, we will now move on and see how that information is further processed in cortical areas. So if you remember on the retinal level we had P and M ganglion cells. P ganglion cells are getting input mostly from cones and have slow receptive fields and they are now transferring information to the parvocellular cells in the LGN. The M ganglion cells, they have large receptive fields, mostly getting input from rods, and they transfer information to the macrocellular cells in the LGN. The P cells in the LGN, or parvocellular cells, are relatively slow, but precise and responsible, for example, for color and other details. The M cells in the LGN are relatively fast but imprecise and can be used particularly well to detect motion. Here you can see a microscopic view, microscopic view of the LGN. Um, this is a left LGN and you can see a clear layer structure in the LGN. You can also see that the P and M cells are spatially separated and within each area you have an organization in contra and ipsilateral layers. So contra here refers to the eye from which the input is originally coming. So since we're here at the left LGN, this means that contra is referring to the right eye. Ipsi, for example number five here, refers to the left eye. Remember that in the left LGN we only have a representation of information from the right visual field, but of course both eyes do have to get input from the right visual field. The visual cortex makes up 30% of the cortex, which is quite a bit if you compare it for example to the auditory cortex which only makes up 3% of the cortex. The primary visual cortex or V1 is the first cortical processing of vision. Apart from the uh, primary visual cortex, also called striate cortex, there are further areas, V2 to V6, which are also referred to as extra striate cortex. The striate cortex is called striate cortex because it has stripes. You can see this here, and this is because of the layer organization of V1. The other areas do not have these this clear stripe, um, this clear layer organization. Even though the fovea only makes up 0.01% of the retina, it makes up 50% of what is processed in V1. The visual cortex is also um, the area in the cortex with the first binocular cells so those cells that get input from both eyes. In human and macaque brains there are corresponding areas, for example the primary visual cortex in humans, area 17, can also be found in macaque mon monkeys. A very important discovery to a better understanding of the visual system was the finding that there is um, neurons that very strongly respond to a stimulus of a specific orientation. This was found by accident by Hubel and Wiesel in 68. They did some visual experiments with cats and there was some crack on the screen. Um, so even though this has stimulus in initial experiments there was actually just a crack on the screen and they found that um, some of the cells were responding very strongly to this crack but not to um, any stimuli of a different orientation. They followed up and compared stimuli of different orientations and as a result the, the um, orientation columns were discovered. So this brings us to the anatomy of the stride cortex. So we have cells in these columns that are very strongly responding to this specific orientation a little bit to stimuli of 
similar orientations, but not at all to stimuli of very different orientations. We also have an ocular dominance orientation uh, column um, structure here. So all these columns do uh, get input from either the contra or ipsilateral eye, so right or left eye, and all this combined is what we refer to as a hypercolumn. So cells in this column here, for example, they would respond very strongly to stimuli presented on the right eye with this orientation. And of course there's not just one hypercolumn, there's very many hypercolumns. And they are retinotopically organized, so that means nearby hypercolumns code visual input from nearby locations in the visual field. So each of these hypercolumns is getting input from specific areas in the visual field, um, but two neighboring hypercolumns would always get input from similar from nearby areas in the visual field. If we look into one layer, we see that M and P cells feed into different layers. Input from P cells also feed into color blobs that are sensitive to a particular color. These are the color blobs here. There are different types of cells in the visual cortex, and the simplest cell is the so-called simple cell that can only be found in V1. So this would be the receptor field of a simple cell in V1 and you can see that they correspond to receptor fields in the LGN. So several LGN cells feed into one simple cell such that the receptor field of the simple cell is elongated like this here. These are the cells in the orientation column. So um, instead of light dots that the cells here in the LGN would respond to most strongly, the simple cells would um, respond most strongly to specific orientations. So for example, if you have an input like this, then you would see no effect here, only sporadic uh, action potentials, nothing going on here. If it's a little bit like this, still not fitting the orientation, there might be some more sporadic activation. But then if you're presented in just the right orientation, you will get a very strong response. And again, of course, you have excitatory and inhibitory zones. So if the light was, for example, presented here as well, so these would be off-center on surround cells then they would inhibit this activation here. So these are the simplest cells in uh, the visual cortex. Complex cells are a bit more complex than simple cells, hence the name. Um, so they can be found in V1 and V2 and they get their information from a number of simple cells. So here you can see individual simple cells and all the, all the simple cells in this receptive field, in this case, they are... Um, so this is the receptive field of these simple cells. And all these simple cells are then forwarding their information to a complex cell. Interestingly, these complex cells do not have very distinct zones of excitation or, or inhibition. Um, so a line of the preferred orientation will let the complex cell fire regardless of where in the receptive field it is. So whether it is here or here doesn't matter. It's the same response that you would get 
either this simple cell or this simple cell would activate the complex cell, but the complex cell itself cannot differentiate between activity here and here. So it's a larger receptor field, importantly. Um, complex cells are also specifically responding to, or um, particularly responding to motion. So if you have something like this, then you would see a lot of activation. Now, hypercomplex cells are more common in later processing stages, so not so much in uh, V1, but rather in V2 and particularly V3 and up. So hypercomplex cells have receptive and antagonistic receptive fields. They respond best to a specific line of length, also called end-stopped cells. They are selective for certain orientation, motion, direction, and length. So very specific activity. So for example, if you have an input like this, you get some increased activation here at the hypercomplex cells. Please note that we have complex cells um, that feed into these hypercomplex cells. And again, this is the receptive field that was previously here. So this is the receptive field of a complex cell. Again, this is the receptive field of a complex cell. And all these three combined are the receptive field of the hypercomplex cell. So if we have a line of light here, for example, we get some increase in the firing rate of the hypercomplex cell, but it doesn't matter where it is. Same here. But if it's longer, then there's more activation. And that's because now two complex cells are firing and giving input to the hypercomplex cell. But if it's a bit too long, and now it is reaching into uh, the receptive field of an antagonistic complex cell, it's antagonistic because it's inhibiting the hypercomplex cell. This is indicated by the red line with the little circle here. So now we also have some inhibition coming from this complex cell, and this reduces the firing rate of the hypercomplex cell. And there's even more complex cell or more specific hypercomplex cells that are um, specifically responding to features like curvature or edges. Um, so these features can also be discriminated by hypercomplex cells. So for example, this would be um, this hypercomplex cell would respond very strongly to um, light with this edge here. This hypercomplex cell would respond very strongly to a circle presented here because a circle like this would then activate these receptive fields of the complex cell but not these antagonistic complex cells. From V1 to higher visual areas, um, more and more complex features are computed, as you could see here. First we have dots, then we have lines, then we have a certain length of lines, and in the end we even talked about circles and edges. Not only is there a distinction of complexity, though, from V1 to V2, there is also a distinction of what aspects are computed where. From V2 on, there is a dorsal where and eventual what pathway. Where and what. Dorsal paths get input from M cells and ventral more from P cells. So from midget and parasol bipolar cells in the retina to LGN cells of different layers, in V1 there is distinct processing of where and what. The where path, for example, the dorsal path, um, is responsible for location and direction, and the ventral path, the what path, for edges, color, and shapes.
and the major principles of visual processing in sum are that we have a retinotopic organization so that means from the retina over LGN V1 and higher cortex areas it is always true that what is near in space and the visual um, field is also what is near in representation. The second principle is modularity so neurons that represent specific features for example orientation um, official stimuli are organized in functional networks for example orientation columns so we have one module that is somehow responsible for computing um, lines of a specific orientation then we have a specialization that's the third principle and describes that the complexity of stimuli that can trigger the maximum response increases with the processing steps. So this is what I mentioned before. We go from single single dots to lines to a certain length of lines and then even shapes. And as, a res um, as an additional um, remark um, I would like to highlight that the size of the receptive field increases. This is if you go from simple cells to complex cells to hyper complex cells they're all connected and they all have their receptive fields but the further you go in the processing the larger the processing uh, the, um, the uh, receptive fields are and they of course also overlap more so they are less spatially organized and have a lower spatial resolution but can uh, compute very specific distinct features this is shown here so you go from small receptive fields that are um, representing very um, indistinct features to large receptive fields that can um, represent very distinct shapes. Um, here you can see a data flow diagram this e these are all the visual areas in the macaque brain and you can see how specialized these areas can be so in blue are the motion perception pathways and in green the object recognition pathways but this is really just to illustrate how complicated the brain is uh, please do not learn this by heart all right so much about the neural basis of visual processing. Now that we understand a little bit more uh, how um, the visual processing works on a neural level, we will now move on to attention, to visual attention.